I was on a farm this week for our curacy training event that we did um, at a dairy farm. Um, learned a lot about cows. Um, it was very fun. Anyone else want to share first job? Raham at the back. Pine stretcher. Pine stretcher. We're going to pine stretcher. My first job was working in McDonald's. Um, straight after my 16th birthday, I worked at McDonald's for a long time. It was actually my longest ever job um, because I changed quite a lot. I loved it. It was great. It was so busy. I was a drive through wizard. Um, absolutely loved sorting out the mess of drive through orders. Um, had a great time. Um, and also, we did lots of very funny pranks on each other too, but we'll not share those exactly this morning. One time, we did get in trouble as a shift because, you know, like the chicken nuggets, everyone loves a chicken nugget, right? And so as you walk back and forward through the drive through from the front to the back, the little thing with the nuggets is just there and you just kind of slide the door out and you pinch a nugget and you walk past, you slide one and you take another nugget. Um, <laughs> and at the end of one of our shifts, the shift manager came and said to us, um, guys, we, so at McDonald's, when someone like, when stuff goes in the bin, it all gets counted. Someone's job is to count what goes in the bin. So they know everything that's made, they know what they've sold, and they know what's gone in the bin. And they came and said, guys, there's like uh, 150 nuggets missing on a shift, on this shift. It was like a whole big box of like, they came in like bags of 36 boxes. They were like, you've, you've taken a whole box of like five bags of nuggets uh, between like the eight of you that's on this shift because everyone's just walking past, eating another nugget, eating another nugget. Um, that's not the story I was going to tell you, but that's a good one. Um, <laughs> um, I, when I was younger, I had a lot of jobs. Like I said, McDonald's was my longest one. It was only two years um, until I was 18. But I had a lot of jobs. I went moved to the post office, um, opening up mail that got sent to the wrong place. Um, I sold bicycles um, in, in time for Christmas. Um, I've done some fundraising for a charity. And I developed a bit of an ego because actually I went through a phase where every job I applied for, I got. I was like, well, this is easy. You just ask for a job and someone gives you a job. Um, I was very close once because I got turned down first and the person they hired didn't want the job and so I was second choice, but I still got the job. So I held on to my record of getting the jobs. Um, and then I became a store manager at a shop. Um, I then went and became a youth worker. Um, still just getting jobs, getting jobs. Um, I was on a permanent contract as a youth worker and then that contract came to an end. I was like, oh, that's easy. I'll just apply for another youth worker job and I'll get a job. And then I didn't. I got told, oh, you didn't get the job. I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't get a job. Well, I'll apply for another one, apply for another one. Didn't get that one either. Didn't get, didn't get the next one or the next one. Came second a lot. People said, oh, you were great. You were great. But we just went another way. It really took, took a bit of a hit to my ego. Kept on phone calls being told, no, no, we're just going to go a different direction. It's not for you. Um, I went for a job managing a youth project that I was encouraged to apply for. You know, one of those ones, like, you should apply for this job. And I thought, this will be it. Finally, I'm going to get myself a job. Um, came second in that one, but it says, okay, we've got a backup job for you. You can come and do like eight hours a week in the youth club um, for us. It's like, fine, I need something, right? I want to be a youth worker. This is my youth worker job, so I, I took that job. But it meant that I got to chat to the guy who interviewed me. Um, and I, as a couple of months later, we kind of just got into one of those chats. And I asked him, like, I thought I was really qualified. Like, how come I didn't get the other job? And he said, well, I'll be honest with you, you presented yourself as too perfect. No matter what we said, no matter what we said the job was going to be, you were like, I've done that before. I've done it in all these three ways. I've got 17 ideas of how I'm going to do it right here. It's like, where, where was the chance for the job to stretch you? Where was the chance for you to say, actually, I'm not that good at that yet, but I want to grow into that. I want to do better at that. Where was really understanding, not coming with one of those fake weaknesses of, <laughs> sometimes I work too hard. <laughs> What was the real thing of saying, actually, I'm not the finished article yet, and I need to grow, and you can improve me, as well as me bringing what I have to you? It was like, it just seemed like you didn't really know yourself. You were just presenting a, a, a picture of, I can do absolutely everything. I've already perfected this job. And so we went with somebody else. And I heard that. Like, that was hard to hear, but I heard it. And a couple of months later, I went for another job. And in that interview, I shared, actually, this is a big step for me. And this is a bit scary for these reasons. And this is what I think I might grow in here. And I got that job, and I moved to London, the whole way from Northern Ireland. And then I met Beth, and then, you know, 10 years later, here we are. But that was a huge step for me in terms of actually understanding myself and knowing that actually it's okay to be vulnerable in those situations. There's a, there's a strength to saying, I'm not perfect. I can be vulnerable. There's things that I need to grow in, things I need to improve in, things that I need to work on about myself. 
Um, and that was a really powerful lesson for me. And I want you to hold that this morning as we then dive into our passage. We're starting a new series. We're going to do four weeks um, that is entitled No Longer Slaves to... Dot, dot, dot. Um, we're exploring, really, the effects of the good news of Jesus. What effect does it have in our lives? Jesus died on the cross for us. He died. Um, but what does that do for us in the here and now? We get eternal life. But is it just eternal life? Does it affect the life that we live here at the moment on this earth right now? I would say, yes, it absolutely does. And we're going to just spend some time exploring how the good news is good news for you right now in your life. Um, and so today we're looking at the fact that we are no longer slaves to sin. Um, and we've talked a little bit about freedom, and that's great. Our passage is going to just give a little bit pushback, actually, against that idea of what does it mean to be free in Christ this morning? What does freedom look like? Um, we're going to jump into the book of Romans. If you want to have a Bible with you, it's chapter 6. Uh, we're going to pick it up. I think it's either verse 14 or 15, wherever that section starts. Um, I think it might come up on the screen behind me as well. Um, Romans is often regarded as Paul's most like organized, systematic book. Um, because most of his other letters, he wrote to people that he knew. Uh, and people who he was in conversation with. And often he was replying to kind of local issues and things that were happening in their context. Um, whereas in Romans, Paul has never been to Rome yet. And he's introducing himself and saying, hey, I'm Paul. This is what I believe. And so he kind of outlines just a little bit more organizedly, systematically, what he thinks is going on. Uh, what he thinks it is about Jesus that they should hear and remember. And so in, in the bit before this section, so far in Romans, he's been outlining how sin affects everybody. And how Torah, the law, is insufficient for salvation. And he's just finished a section where he's contrasted Adam with Jesus and said, look, Adam brought sin into the world. Jesus has come to fix that um, and, and defeat sin by his death and resurrection. And I, I think one of the main points in this book and in this section is he, he's emphasizing, actually, you need to live resurrected life now. You need to think about what it means to be living in the reality that Jesus has conquered death, conquered sin, and start living that in your life here on earth right now. Essentially saying, we've changed the ending of the story, and that affects everything else. That affects the journey that you're going through right now. And so in this section then that we get to, Paul is starting to anticipate some questions that might arise uh, because of what he said. The first one that we're not going to really cover today, he says, uh, well, if Jesus' grace covers sin, and it keeps covering sin, then if I just sin more, there'll be more grace. And that's a good thing, right? He says, no, that's not really how it works. Um, and then he comes to a second question, which we are going to look at. He says, okay, well, if we're free from the law, can we just do whatever we want? If we're not covered by things that are moral of saying, are they right and wrong? If we're freed from all of that, is it just anything goes? And I get to do whatever it is that I choose. He says, no. He says, no, that's not quite how it works. Um, and he uses an analogy and a little disclaimer here, he's going to talk about slavery and that to explain his point. And he says himself, I'm using kind of this weird human analogy so that you get it. But I understand that particularly for people in our congregation, the imagery of slavery, the language of slavery is going to be really difficult. It's going to be difficult to hear, difficult to process. It might birth some things in you. Um, if you need to leave, that's fine. If you need to ignore me, that's also fine. Um, because we're all at different places. But it's just worth acknowledging that, that, that it's, a, it's a very complicated thing. And I don't think that Paul is saying that it's okay. Um, but he's also not saying this is an abomination. He's kind of accepting it as part of his culture um, in this passage and using it to make a point about God. Um, and that is just worth us acknowledging and saying um, as, we, as we explore this together. I think the reason he uses this analogy is because he wants to rule out the idea that there is an objective state of freedom. He wants to rule out the idea that you can be freed from one thing and suddenly be in a state of complete freedom. He's using the analogy because you, something is your Lord. Something has authority over you. And he's saying, well, which is it? Is it sin or is it Jesus? That's, I think, the reason that he, he uses this. Um, and so he's saying to the Christians in Rome that you were unknowingly under the power of sin. Then you were maybe knowingly under the power of sin, but now what are you? He says, now not, you're not completely free. He says you're under the authority of Jesus. You're under the authority of Christ. And that changes something about it. He's saying the power of sin is broken because a more powerful power has come. 
undefeated sin and death. So let's read the passage. Um, I'm reading from the, from the NRSV. Um, and it says, What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Being under grace, Paul says, isn't an anything goes way of life. He says, actually, you place yourself, you submit yourself under a new authority and live a new resurrection kind of life. Following on from his link to Adam in the garden, he's saying, look, that brought death, that brought sin, that brought evil into the world, when actually Adam was supposed to live at peace with himself, with God, with the animals, with Eve, with people. He says, actually, that's, that's the kind of thing that's been fixed here. We get to live the proper garden life, the resurrected life. The snake has been defeated and is no longer a real threat to you. And then he says the, the last verse of that passage that we read, verse 18. He says, you've been set free from sin and become slaves of righteousness. We're going to spend about most of our time here this morning. Slaves of righteousness is a weird turn of phrase. I think we can just throw that out there. Um, often in my church upbringing, I was reminded and told repeatedly that righteousness meant that I tried really hard to be good. Particularly as a teenager, that meant don't drink, don't swear. Be really good all of the time. And if you mess up, just try a bit harder next time to be gooder. And then it'll work out better. And I got myself constantly into a cycle, and this went the whole way through into my 20s, of being quite aware of the times that I messed up and my sin and my failures, and then feeling a sense of shame that I was a bad Christian. All these people that I see in church, they're good Christians, but I'm a bad one because I had an extra beer last night, or I swore at my mate when I was watching, with my mate when I was watching the football, or I made a coarse joke, or I did this, or I did that, and so I'm a bad Christian, and so maybe Jesus doesn't want to know me this morning in church, so I'll not engage in the worship, and I'll shrink back a little bit, and I'll distance myself from God and put a separation in there. We'll read on later in Romans that there is nothing that separates us from the love of Jesus. And after a while, I'd probably be in that distant place. I would have, someone would have reminded me of that in church and I would have taken a step forward and then be like, okay, there's nothing that says we from God, so I've got to try harder. I've got to put more effort in. I'm going to be really good this time. So I work slightly harder, do slightly better for maybe a little bit longer, and then I fail again. And I die back down. And I tried really hard that time, so now I must be a really bad Christian. And the cycle continues, and it continued, and it continued. But this chapter a little bit earlier says that our old self has been crucified with Christ, and so we're free. It says that doesn't exist anymore. It is, we have died with Christ and been raised to something new. We are free from the power of sin, free from the sins we commit, free from the sins that are committed against us, from the hurt and the pain that people do, free from the shame of our own failures. Free instead to be slaves of righteousness. And here in this passage, I think it's something beautiful that I missed until, you know, a couple of years ago. And I'm still unpicking those cycles that I get trapped into of thinking that I have to try harder to be good. Maybe that's the same for you this morning. In this passage, sin is not presented as the little naughty things that you do. Actually, it's a power that is over you, that corrupts you, a power that is at work in your life. It's not just doing naughty stuff. It is, it is an evil and a power that seeps into your life and twists everything and contorts everything. And then righteousness is not said, well, that's actually you just trying harder to live a little bit nicer. Righteousness is this whole new power that smashes that power. And it says, I want to be at work in your life. Righteousness isn't something we achieve by just trying harder. Righteousness belongs to God. It is God's righteousness, and we submit ourselves to it and say, actually, we're going to live under that power. We're going to let God into our lives and transform us from the inside out. We are saved by grace alone. We're not saved by grace and then keep it going by working really hard and trying hard to be good. 
Righteousness, I don't think anymore, is human behavior. It's not my naughtiness or my goodness. It's not sinlessness. Righteousness is not actually within human control. It is God's to give. It is a gift of grace, and we place ourselves under it and become slaves to it and do what it tells us in our lives. Righteousness is the power of God under which we sit. It is love and grace and hope that works itself out in our lives as the Spirit works through us, teaching us and helping us to live a resurrected life. For me, this is a really transformative idea that actually gives freedom from the shame that I experienced for so much of growing up. Because actually, I just need to relax, like Elijah earlier, and just let God work in my life. I know that as I submit myself, my job is only to submit my whole self to him. And he will work in me, and he will transform my mind, and he will lead me into the kind of life that he has for me. It's not about me trying harder to just be better. God knows that we are living in this weird state where we still have the effects of sin in our life. Paul will explore this paradox in the next chapter. If you want to go home and read that, it's really helpful. But here he's saying you're freed from the power of that over your life and you can freely place yourself under righteousness. It's not about being free to do whatever you want. It's saying actually God knows the real best way to live and we place ourselves under that. An analogy that I've heard used a few times is about playing the piano. I, I learned piano when I was a kid. It took me about five years. I got to grade one and then I quit. And if you place it in front of a piano now, I would bang some things. I might remember where middle C is. I might get halfway through Mary had a little lamb until it gets to the complicated bit that doesn't repeat and then I'd forget the next bit. If I stand in front of the piano, I'm not particularly free with the piano. Even though I could do whatever I wanted, I could bang it as hard as I wanted. It's not beautiful. It's not great. You'd all cover your ears. I'm not really free. Someone who knows how to play the piano, someone who knows what each of those keys do, Someone who knows how to move their fingers, how to stretch their finger to reach that note that's right up there. Somebody who knows the rules of playing the piano, who understands that instrument really well, you sit them in front of a piano, and they are free, and it is beautiful. And so when we get caught up in this cycle of trying to follow rules, I think really it's about trusting God to teach us that he knows the piano better than us. He knows the world that we live in. He knows ourselves better than us. And he is going to teach us about that so that then we can make beautiful music with a kind of freedom that comes from knowledge, not just following some rules. Real pianists, the best pianists that I've seen and met, sometimes they break the real rules of the piano because they know which ones to break at just the right time to do that thing a little bit different to make something interesting happen. Because they know it. And they know what they can do and they know their skills and they know where their finger can reach. They know their capabilities and they know their limitations. There's a lady called Brené Brown. We're going to watch a little video in a second. Um, if you haven't heard of her, check her out on YouTube. She is brilliant. If you like reading books, she's got some great books. Um, she's also done TED Talks, uh, which are like little 10 to 20 minute segments where people who are like experts in their field unpack their knowledge in about 20 minutes. Um, they're really fun if you need something to watch and learn from. Um, and she talks about this idea of shame and about how we tackle it. She does research. She researched for like 10 years the idea of shame and why as human beings we feel shame. And so we're going to watch some of her reflections on that now and then I'll finish up. I think the way that we live in this life, if we want to break some of those things of bullying and addictions and those behaviours that she listed, is to show empathy with each other and show empathy with ourselves and be vulnerable. Open ourselves up, most importantly, to God's righteousness, to his goodness and his knowledge of us. I, I really don't think the Christian life is about trying hard to be good. It's also not about doing just whatever you feel like whenever you want. The Christian life is offering all of yourself to God. Submitting the fullness of who you are to him who knows you even better. To be vulnerable enough to place the fullness of yourself into God's hands and to trust his goodness and his righteousness. You will struggle against sin and shame in this life, but you should know that you are under, if you love Jesus, a greater power. The name of Jesus. 
And the weapon against sin and shame, as Bernie said, I think, is vulnerability. And to know that in Christ you are truly worthy of love and belonging and purpose and peace. And that that is why Jesus came and that is why Jesus died. And so the action this morning for us is some vulnerability with God and with each other. To submit yourself to the power of God. Not to desire absolute freedom, but to desire to live under the righteousness of God. The God who gave himself up for you in return that you can give yourself to Christ. And that means your fullest self, not the one that I put forward in job interviews, the perfected self, the everything's fine self, but actually the darkness that's in you, the sadness that's in you, the secrets, the hopes, the dreams, the joys, the failures, the raw desires, the pains, all of it. All of it we give to God. And say, we trust you with all of that, God. And then we'll see how he dismantles shame and dismantles sin and calls us to live beautiful, resurrected life.